meetings and it was great. <laughs> we clubbed a bear and brought it home for dinner. <laughs> All right, y'all, we're getting this meeting started here and getting it up on the Facebook page. And uh, we'll actually get started and hold over in just a second once we have confirmation. Okay, it looks like it's going. Cool. All right, so I don't want to see it with my face. So I'm going to just hide that. And welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our October general meeting for the Jackson County Democratic Party. Um, my name is Pete Fuller. I am the chair. And... Um, um, we want to start off this meeting, first of all, with a, a short moment of silence. Um, and during this um, pandemic, we've had, um, we know that there's been a lot lost, but we also have had, we just want to remember again, our uh, extremely brave healthcare workers that have been going through this for the entire year and a half now, um, not to mention our teachers and others that have been out in the face of this for a while. So we want to take just a few seconds to think about our those folks and uh, we'll get us into the right frame of mind before we start our business and start our discussions. All right. Um wanted to um, also make note of some any uh, any upcoming events or things that are going on. Um, I, I did have a reminder again sent to me that the Boys and Girls Club is going to be having their car and bike show on Saturday at between 10 and 2 um, off Gordon Street, the Boy, Boys and Girls Club area there. Uh, that is a big fundraiser for them, and that is a a organization that we continue to support in um, their efforts and everything they're doing. So um, we've got a fairly locked down meeting tonight. If you have any events that are coming up or meetings that you think that we need to be aware of, please put that in the chat box. Uh, we're going to be filtering our messages through the chat tonight. And if you um, have anything, send that to me. And the meeting is being recorded and it's being uh, sent to Facebook Live as well for anybody that's uh, want to take part there. Uh, not seeing anything else there. Um, I do want to make some, a couple of remarks here. Um, thank everybody for being here. We are, um, we've got a kind of a weird meeting. This is our general meeting. We're going to a, a split format. I think as many of y'all know, we had our business meeting where we did all the fun talking about our reimbursement votes and all that good stuff and our committee business last week. And this week we're doing our, as we go into 2020, we are 2022, we are going into more of our speakers and having folks uh, around the state of interest come in and talk to us. Um, and we also ended up deciding because of various reasons to actually try to put on a candidate forum for different candidates, municipal candidates that's going for the races that are going on this year as well. Uh, partially because we just didn't see this being done and we had some requests for this. And um, we all live here. And um, regardless of whose party that people vote for at the national level, we all live here. We want to hear from these folks. And, um, and I think it's good for the area to hear from folks. And, um, and I'm, I'm glad for all the folks that have decided to join us for this. And that's going to be half kicking off at 7 o'clock sharp. Uh, but before that, we have the, uh, the pleasure of having Dr. John Eves on with us. Uh, he is running for Secretary of State in the state of Georgia. And... Um, this is an incredibly important position in the state this year. Um, the fact that our current Secretary of State's name is, is known nationally right now, that's not a normal thing and not a good thing normally for your Secretary of State to be known everywhere. Uh, that's how important Georgia is right now and how important that office is. So um, we're going to give Dr. Eves um, our attention there. We're going to let him speak. If you have any questions for him, please put them in the chat box. Uh, again, we are filtering questions through the chat box. Please uh, put them in there, and um, we'll get them to him. And Dr. Reeves, thank you for being here, please. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you so much, Pete, for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the Jackson County Dems. Um, this is the 25th 
county that I have either visited and spoken with Dems or uh, had the occasion to speak virtually. And so I'm excited about uh, this opportunity to share with uh, those of you who are present uh, or at this meeting. So again, I'm John Eaves and I am uh, running for Secretary of State as Pete indicated. And this past weekend, uh, not only are you the 25th uh, county that I have spoken with, this past weekend, I want you to know, Dems, that I have driven 900 miles throughout Georgia. This past weekend, I went to Chatham County. I went to Bryan County, spoke to Dems there, as well as Chatham County. I went down to Glenn County. Then I went to Camden County and Carlton County. So I hit five counties uh, this past weekend, drove 900 miles, and I did all the driving by myself. And it's, I did it because I wanted to reach out to uh, Dems across the state, and I'm going to continue to doing that because I want to hear stories of Georgians and their challenges and struggles, as well as their successes and their level of interest in the Secretary of State's office. As Pete pointed out, this position, this race is important. Uh, not only is it important, Georgia, uh, I was looking at CNN three weeks ago, Inside Politics, Sunday morning, and then in the midst of for um, media folks, commentary, folks talking about the state of elections, the state of races around the country, various gubernatorial races, lieutenant governor races, attorney general races, they honed in very specifically and they said the most important race in the country next year will be the Georgia Secretary of State's office race. And some of the reasons that Pete alluded to are the reasons for it. And so I'm excited about my candidacy and I am in the race for many obvious reasons. Uh, as you know, there certainly is something happening in terms of the elections process, the voting process, not only in the state of Georgia, but across the country in which voting laws have been passed that are designed in the eyes of Republicans to address issues of integrity, but in the eyes of those of us who are Democrats who see this as restrictive, denying and limiting access to voting. I'm a mentee of John Lewis. I served as chairman of Fulton County for 11 years, and I interacted with John Lewis many times. And Congressman John Lewis often said that voting is a sacred right. And Dems, I believe that voting is a sacred right. I believe that everyone, Democrat, Republican, black, white, brown, Asian, gay, straight, rural communities, urban communities, rich, poor should have the ability to vote. That's how democracies work. And so I'm gonna do all that I can to make sure that everyone has access to voting. And I believe that everyone should have the ability to vote and let the chips fall where they may in terms of people voting, and 50 plus one is who decide who wins the race. So I believe very firmly and fervently that voting should be accessible to everyone. And so I am running number one because I wanna protect the right to vote and I wanna make voting accessible to everyone who wants to vote. The other reason why I'm voting, which is very important that is often overlooked is the Secretary of State's office is actually an executive position. It has, a, executive um, responsibility. It has administrative oversight. It's not just the elections division, which oversees the elections of the 159 counties in Georgia, as well as the voting uh, registration rolls of 8 million plus Georgians. But the other aspect of the position that is very important and which actually resonate in small town Georgia is the corporations division. This is the division that incorporates all businesses in our state, large and small, the 1.1 million small businesses in Georgia. I am a small business owner. I have actually three small businesses. The state collects $100 from me every year for my three businesses. And the Secretary of State's office provides, collects these dollars. And in, in exchange for your $100 fee, you get articles of incorporation, but you get very little else in return for it. I believe that small businesses are the backbone of our economy. They are what 
causes the wheels to turn in big cities as well as, as in small cities. And I believe that small businesses, as well as the medium-sized companies and large corporations, but especially small businesses, need to have an advocate, someone who is going to be supporting the small business sector. And again, I am a small business owner myself. I enjoy the autonomy of owning my businesses and being my own boss, but I certainly experience ebbs and flows in terms of the successes and the challenges of operating small businesses. And I think that there's a great opportunity for the Secretary of State's office to, among other things, when you collect the $100 for the 1.1 million businesses, that's $101 million. I'm a strong believer that those dollars shouldn't necessarily go into the general fund of the, uh, of the state, but should be reinvested back into communities, reinvested in terms of supporting small business owners, providing a competitive grants program. Because when I talk with small businesses, usually their biggest challenge is accessing capital to grow their businesses. And so the federal government does creative things. When I was chairman of Fulton County, we did creative things in terms of supporting human service grant providers or human service organizations and nonprofits and creative arts industry so we can do it also on the state. And also related to this issue of small businesses, I am a firm believer in diversity. I have a very diverse background. I embrace the diversity of our state. It is our strength. We have uh, quite a few black and brown business owners in our state. However, when it comes to the procurement of contracts, the 1,260 procurement agencies in our state, these are state agencies, these are uh, local governments, county, city, school board, governments. But when it comes to procuring contracts, even though we have a population of 49% non-white and 32% black, very few black and brown business owners actually receive the procurement of contracts when, uh, when they seek opportunities on the state and the local level. I'm proud of the fact when I was chairman of Fulton County, we had political will, we recognized the diversity of our county and we procured 35% of our contracts to women and to black owned businesses. We procured $300 million worth of contracts every year. And 35% of our contracts went to women and black people who are business owners. So I'm proud of that. And I think the state of Georgia should do the same thing. We have diversity, but we don't have inclusion when it comes to opportunities that small business owners should be able to get business opportunities with local government and state government. The third function of the Secretary of State's office is the administrative oversight of 42 licensing boards. Uh, these are licensing, these are professional occupations in the state, and they have licensing boards that oversee their certification process. And I would do all that I can to provide support, but also make sure that I use the bully pulpit to make sure that those, uh, those uh, associations also do what it can do to be more inclusionary than they are right now in terms of people of color and women being uh, certified professionals in their respective associations. So the question that you may be asking is, what makes you qualified for running for Secretary of State of Georgia? Well, I happen to have served for 11 years and served admirably as a chairman of the largest local government in the state of Georgia. Yes, Jackson County is important, uh, but Fulton County is also very important. I represented 1.1 million people. I was the second Democrat ever uh, elected to the position of chairman in 2006 and served from 2007 to 2017. And we did great things under my leadership, ranging from supporting uh, and saving Grady Hospital to criminal justice reform, passing the first ever transportation splice in Fulton County's history, balancing the budget, um, and also doing a lot of support for the small business sector. I also had the opportunity to provide oversight for the elections board of Fulton County that provided the governance for uh, the elections in our county. 
we weren't perfect, but we still did some good things under my leadership in terms of being one of the first counties to have um, Sunday voting, souls to the poll, three weeks in advance voting. We operated over 300 precincts in our county and we did as best as we could. We had a lot of successes, successes and I certainly provided the support and I learned a lot about the importance of administering elections on the local level. But aside from my political experience, friends, I want you to know that I have strong professional experiences. I'm the former regional director of the Peace Corps for the Southeastern region. I served for seven years. I'm also a Fulbright Scholar recipient. I have taught at many colleges and universities around the country, as well as being an administrator. And I currently teach in political science at Spelman College. I've been doing that for the past three years. So friends, I am very excited about this candidacy. I have traveled extensively throughout the state over the past five months. I'm gonna be doing a whole lot more. Uh, I listen, I also have great ideas and I have strong experiences. And I'm looking forward to serving you uh, in Jackson County, as well as the 150 other uh, counties in our state. And so as I close out, um, I often say that uh, I'm proud about my professional accomplishments. I'm proud about my political uh, experiences and achievements. I've learned from some of my challenges. I've learned from some mistakes, but I'm proud of the things that I've done. But the thing that I'm most proud about is now I am at the uh, stage in my life where I have quite a bit of experience but I also am a proud grandfather three months ago. And my granddaughter, her name is Brielle. And when I look at her, I want her to be a part of a prosperous future in Georgia, where there are no limitations based on gender, no limitations based on race. And the way that we get there, my friends, is to truly have a democracy when it comes to voting, when it, becomes, when it comes to everyone having that right and that ability, and I'm certainly gonna do that, but also believe that we can have a true vibrant uh, democracy when people want to be small business owners and they have the ability to access the American dream and eat the American pie, the apple pie. And so I want to do that for not only my granddaughter, for all uh, young girls and boys in her generation, even people in our generation, because I want everyone to be able to access the good and the best of our state. And I believe that we can get there. Yes, we are at a crossroads, but it's important for the person with the right temperament, the right experience, the right uh, character, and the right um, belief system to be in this office, a person who has integrity. So Pete, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk and share with your members. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions, as well as um, listen to any concerns or observations that anyone likes to make at this time. So again, my name is John Eves. I'm running as a Democrat for the Secretary of State uh, office, and I would love to get your vote, and I will also love to get your support of my, my campaign. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And, um... As I also wear the hat of the Rural Council Chair, it is great that you're actually getting out of the 285 area and actually yes. getting around the state. Um, that's one big deficit of our a lot of our Democratic candidates is we tend to stick inside the metro area and don't visit the rest of this huge state. And we've got a lot of good things out here. Um, and, I, and, I, and this initially, y'all asked to come actually come visit us. I know that y'all actually wanted to come out to to us here instead of doing this by Zoom. And hopefully in the near future, we can start doing all that again. Uh, the way the numbers were looking at the time this meeting was scheduled, that just wasn't possible for us and our, our folks here. Um, if anyone has questions, please open up your chat and send those to me. Um, what's been the, um, the most interesting place you've been to in the state and what have they, what have they told you? What is, what's been, and I've got my, my dog just came in the background. Um, what's, uh, where, what's been your most interesting visit around the state? So far? Yeah, you know, I, to your point, some of the small communities have been really eye-opening and the reception of folks in Camden County, Kingsland, uh, Woodbine, uh, 
uh, Dublin, LaGrange, Thomaston. It has been what you said. They are just so excited and can't believe that an Atlanta politician has come to see them. <laughs> but you know, um, Georgia is a, is a very special place. It's a place where um, obviously the Atlanta area is the economic engine of our state, but there certainly is a lot of despair. Um, a lot of the haves and the have nots, uh, and especially the have nots are in some of these small communities. And they want jobs and they want to have the opportunity to be able to um, have vibrant small businesses. And this issue of voting, which everyone in the state is concerned about and consider it important, there are some signs of uh, less voter activity, even though it's somewhat early in the early voting election cycle uh, for the municipal election, but some of the absentee um, applications have been down, not only in small town America, uh, Georgia, but also in Atlanta and Fulton County. So the long response to your question, um, Pete, is um, there is some degree of despair and concern, despair economically, concern about um, voting. But I think that there's also a degree of optimism in the fact that I took my time out, not to say that I'm going to win. I'm certainly working hard to try. But taking time out to go and hear uh, the stories and the concerns that Georgians in small town America, uh, small town Georgia have, and so tell them as Secretary of State, I'm going to do what I can to support them. Now, with uh, in regards to Senate Bill 202, how hamstrung do you think you would be if elected, and what steps could you take to roll back some of that? Yeah, so I, I think it's important for people to know that the, the state stripped away basically two um, powers of the Secretary of State. Uh, number one was um, not being able to chair the state election board, only being an ex officio officer, and also not being able to get funding from outside sources to support efforts to educate uh, people about the, the voting process. Absent of those two things um, being stripped away, it's still a very powerful position administratively as well as executive wise. And um, the, the, you still have interactions with the 159 counties, you have investigatory responsibility, you have the ability to define, but you also have the ability to educate. I'm an educator by training. And I think that there's a lot of confusion right now about voting and the, specific, the specifics of uh, uh, applying for absentee um, uh, ballots. So, Education is one of the things that I will do. But the other thing that I will do, uh, it, will, it will actually serve as a check for the state election board. Now I have attended a couple of meetings virtually. And first of all, the state election board, which certifies the elections across the state, it is incredibly skewed Republican. There are four members currently on that board, three Republicans and one Democrat. And as I indicated earlier, I am truly about diversity and inclusion. And I just want you to understand that. I respect all races and I believe that everybody should be at the table. All of my staffs have always been diverse because I think that that lends itself to great thinking and great action. But I do find it very troubling that the state election board does not have a black person on it. And we have a 32% black population in our state. And so I think that we need to have some diversity on that state board. And so I got a concern in terms of the, the highly partisan makeup of the board. And I have a concern that it does not have diversity on that board like it should. And so I will certainly call the question. I will be fair to everybody. But if there's some deliberate attempts that are designed to minimize the access of voting for black and brown communities, I'm going to, I'm going to defend it and I'm gonna counter it because there is not any diversity right now on that board or diversity like it should be. Absolutely, and that's, that's excellent to hear you say that because that's, we, <clears throat> being able to be a check on that is a huge thing um, when it comes to what we're dealing with right now. Um, 
if anyone has any questions, please enter them in the chat. Otherwise, we are going to thank Dr. Ease for being with us there. And um, we hope that we can bring him back here at some point when we get, get to going in person. And um, I, I would love to. I mean, listen, Zoom is the, is the next best thing, but the personal touch, <laughs> you know, is, is no replacement for that. And I, I, and I get energy and I like and enjoy the opportunity to interact with people. And so obviously COVID is an is a, is a understandable um, problem, challenge, deterrent right now. So thank you so much for accommodating me through your virtual format, but when and if the occasion presents itself to have face-to-face, -face, whether it's a formal meeting that the Jackson Dems hosts or whether it's just an activity that's occurring in Jefferson or some of the other towns and, uh, in Jackson County, I'll be more than happy to come up and meet folks, meet Georgians in Jackson County. So again, Pete, thank you so much for the opportunity. I've enjoyed it. And friends, um, I would love to get your support of my campaign. Um, my website is John Eaves, E-A-V-E-S, for F-O-R, Georgia, spelling it out, G-E-O-R-G-I-A dot com. I would love to get your support, and I would love to come and visit with you personally sometime soon. Have a great meeting, and have an enjoyable evening as well. Thank you so much. Thank you much. Good love on that grandbaby. And we'll, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, y'all. And now we're going to switch it up here. Let me uh, put up here what our, uh, there's a little button out there it is. Um, I want to share out the agenda here because that has basically what we're going to be doing for the next um, little bit here. Um, we want to thank all, all of our candidates for being on here. And I want to start this off as well. And this goes for Dr. Ease too. I want to thank everybody that's put their name in the hat to do this. Um, it is a special thing to get up off the bench and to actually put your name out there for office. Because um, especially for a local office like this, um, if you're doing it right, your financial reward will be many dozens of dollars maybe. Uh, and the way I understand it, basically, you might be able to afford all of the ibuprofen you're going to need for the headaches it's going to give you. Um, but yeah, we've this is what democracy is, is us basically running a government ourselves at this very local level. And these are our friends. These are our neighbors. These are people that we should be able to reach out and talk to. And uh, every one of these folks that we've um, got here, you know, to communicate was in some respect and everybody's been pleasant and everybody is at the end of the day we all live here and at the end of the day we all want the same things we want safe schools we want good roads we want school we want uh, clean air and clean water and a safe place to live um so well thank everybody for being here um and the way we want to do this is basically we're going to this is not a debate it's a forum um so we are going to start this out uh, each candidate that's in a contested race is going to get 15 minutes. Um, and they were given some stuff that we were might like to hear about, but they basically were given the floor to them. And this We hope this can be a very conversational thing, not something that is, uh, we're not looking for gotcha things. We're not looking to put anybody on the, on the spot. We just want to hear your vision about what you think about this area and what, you're, what you want to see and what you want to accomplish if you are elected to the... Um, to the role in which you are uh, money for. Um, all questions will be uh, through the Zoom chat function. So please uh, use that. That will filter it through us and uh, we will present it. Uh, we do reserve the right if it's something that's out of bounds not to ask it, but um, that is how we're gonna handle Q and A. Um, and this will come out of the 15 minutes that we were giving each candidate um, for that. And um, we're going to start off here with um, Malcolm Gramley. We're doing this by by uh, city and then last name is how we came up with the order for the um, for who's going first. And first of all, it's going to be Ward Two, Jefferson, uh, Mr. Malcolm Gramley. And I'm going to take this off of the screen, and I'm going to unmute Mr. Gramley, and then we will start our time and. Um, and then, um, welcome, sir. 
Thank you very much, Pete. I appreciate it. Uh, it's not very often I get to do this on a on a computer, but hey, it's the new law. Oh, sorry, sorry. I just tried to mute myself, and I muted you instead. I'm sorry. How's that? There we go. All right, now we're hitting it. We oh, I love this electronic age. <laughs> Um, anyway, as Pete has said, first of all, thank you a lot, <clears throat> especially to Pete for putting all this stuff together. I appreciate everybody who's taking time out to sit there and listen to me. Uh, at least we can stay home and do this and we don't have to get in the car and drive 30 miles. Um, as Pete said, my name is Malcolm Gramley. I'm the incumbent uh, council person for uh, District 2, Jefferson City Council, and I am running for re-election. Um, a little background on myself. I'm uh, I'm a, uh, retired. I am a forester by profession, and I am retired with 40 years of government service with the federal government. And I am that includes my military time. My wife and I moved to Jefferson in 2002, and Jefferson is our 13th home. We have moved, no doubt. And we found out early on when you move, if you sit on the front porch and wait for people to come to you, you're gonna be there a long time. So it's always been our policy, if you will. We move someplace new, we go out and we put ourselves out there and volunteer and get involved in the community. And so that's what we did when we first came here, we got involved with civic activities, the Main Street program. I went and volunteered with the volunteer fire department here in Jefferson. And I made a decision <clears throat> about 10 years ago that I was going to run for council. And I've been on the council for eight years, but two years before I ran, I took the time to attend every council meeting and see what took place, how it was run, what their authority was, what their, uh, where, what they were doing and how they were doing it. And it gave me a real, uh, background, if you will, on what the uh, council was all about and what was taking place. And so I wound up being elected the first time. I've enjoyed the time here. I think I still have something to uh, provide for the city. And so I'm looking for the uh, opportunity to go ahead and get reelected. Now, Pete, you sent some questions out um, I may have misinterpreted, but I would like to take those questions as they come. And one has to do with the uh, population increase and how, um, what examples there are of areas that are doing things right when it comes to development and growth. And those that are apparently that everyone has knowledge of that are doing it wrong. But to be honest about it, that's a very subjective question and I have trouble coming up with an answer. What I deem as being a good example of growth, someone else is probably gonna argue with me about. And what they deem, I might be arguing with them. I really don't have a really good answer, but let me tell you this. If the city of Jefferson is going to grow, if we don't control the growth, the growth will control us. And so it's always been that uh, objective when I was involved in the council meetings that always kept my attention focused. We have good industrial tax base, a good uh, residential tax base here in the city and our commercial and retail tax base is something to be desired, but we're working on it. And I think we're making some headway and I think things are gonna be really interesting. and. New, new stuff on the horizon all the time. Secondly was the uh, concern about racial discrimination. Now, I'm not gonna tell you there's no discrimination out there, but I am gonna tell you that it has never, in the years I've been on council, never been brought to my attention. If there's something out there, it certainly hasn't been told to me. Now, for a long time, uh, the state of Georgia is, has been under a consent decree from the Federal Department of Justice. Several states in the Southeast were under that decree. 
And that requires the state and the counties and the cities to periodically report to the Department of Justice. In addition, the city of Jefferson has taken and accepted federal grant and or uh, loan dollars. And as part of that, we have to, as a city, we have to uh, certify annually what we have done under Title IV and Title VI of the uh, Civil Rights Act in regard to discrimination. Everyone in this city is treated the same. And I, if there's something there, it's never been brought to my attention. And so I don't know uh, where to take it from there, but I certainly have never had anybody bring it to my attention. Um, talking about matching funds and uh, the types of housing, the city has a variety of housing, has always had a variety of housing. And part of our comprehensive development plan states that we will provide housing for all different income levels. We have new apartments coming in on the north side of town, 360 units. We've got two senior resident uh, uh, areas or subdivisions. We've got a senior resident uh, apartment building and we have a, a variety of homes coming in all the different uh, cost uh, or, or excuse me, all the different uh, financial levels so that we have a wide variety of homes. And I know nowadays it seems strange to have a starter home at $300,000. I don't know where that's going, but we are going to continue to uh, have all of the, uh, the various levels of housing available here in the city. We have, uh, again, all of, well, the, other, the last question that you ask has to do with Jackson County and the pristine area. And it has to do with growth and manufacturing. Well, I'm here to tell you, I've really got two main issues that I am involved in and want to see taken care of. First one has to do with infrastructure. And that has to do with all of the uh, water, sewer, what have you, that the city provides, services that the city provides so that it can grow and so that it can meet the needs of the citizens. For instance, we are in the process of developing a new water source called Parks Creek, about a 200 acre impoundment. We currently are under contract with a civil engineering firm who will be taking care of uh, doing the uh, uh, horizontal and vertical control work to be a part of the development and then draw us a design for how we're gonna work with this. Hopefully within the next four, perhaps six years, it will be online and we should be good for our water needs for the foreseeable future. In addition, uh, as distasteful as it might sound, we do need to get more wastewater treatment. Uh, we have one plant in the center of the city, but the city is expanding northward and getting further and further away from the main plant. So we're in the process of developing a package plant that will be installed north of the interstate. It would, should be online by the end of 2023 or 20, early in 2024. That's the estimate we've been given. We're hoping to hold people's feet to the fire and have that to happen. The other thing that's happened is we have, uh, with the new census, we find ourselves uh, getting larger by uh, statistics, it's at 10,000 population, you leave the small city category and go to the large city category. It would appear from the information we've been given from the uh, Census Bureau that Jefferson's gonna come out somewhere in the neighborhood of 13,000, somewhere north of 13,000 people. That puts us into a new category. It means we're gonna to have to compete with folks in Lawrenceville and Gainesville and Athens and so forth for federal uh, grants and the like of that, but also is going to make us work toward a uh, stormwater abatement program. We'll have to start dealing with permeable and impermeable uh, surfaces when we're dealing with 
development and the like of that. And it's going to take some education on our part to the public. And it's going to be a while before we get everything in place, but it's, it's going to happen. And, and I'm looking forward to it. It's kind of a challenge. The second area of interest I have is public safety. Um, the, in, in regard to the police department, uh, the city of Jefferson is expanding, has about 22 square miles. There are currently four policemen on shift on 12 hour shifts. I don't know how much longer they can keep doing that. That's just too few people for too large an area. So we've got to look about hiring and expanding the, the uh, money for the police department. The other part of it is, and, and this is kind of strange because uh, we need somehow to come up with a, uh, a way of retaining once we have this policeman in place. It costs us about $100,000 plus or minus to get a policeman off the street into the organization and get them trained up. That's a lot of money. Um, the thing of it is once, they, once they've completed their training, they're obligated to the city for a period of two years. But in the meantime, they're looking around and they're seeing other cities that are paying more money, that have better benefits, that have, and I don't know what it is just yet, but we have to work towards keeping these people in place and making it worth their while to stay here. Uh, don't know how we're gonna go about doing that, but that's a challenge that I look, kind of look forward to. The other half of the public safety has to do with the fire department. The, <clears throat> the fire department, when I joined, was a totally volunteer organization. It's now part full-time, part volunteer, and it's getting to be more and more full-time people. The problem is with a volunteer organization, when you have a fire, which you don't know when it's going to occur, you have to, you don't know how many people can show up. So you have to have a core of individuals who can respond to fires immediately and then have the volunteers fill in behind. The area that Jefferson is lucky with is a lot of our firemen are, who volunteer are full-time firemen in other jurisdictions, uh, Gwinnett, Hall County, uh, Sandy Springs, Atlanta. And we get the benefit of their experience and their training, which makes it makes our fire department really an outstanding organization because of all that background that they have. In addition, the uh, fire department was set up back in 2000, 1999, somewhere in that area. And the stations that were put in were great for the time, but the city's expanded. So we're going to have to do something about expanding our service area. Um, we don't know exactly where that's going to happen, but we're looking forward to maybe building some new stations. We're also looking at uh, equipment replacement for the fire department and fire department equipment is terribly, terribly expensive. We're in the throes right now where we may wind up having to buy or we're looking at buying an additional ladder truck that's going to run the city somewhere between 700 and $900,000 for a single vehicle. So funding is part of it. It's going to be, it's going to be a, a, an interesting time. And the last thing of course, I would like to talk about just real briefly is the streets and roads. The city has about 80 some miles of streets that have to be taken care of. The, that's just the city's portion. We have state roads and county roads that intersect into the city. And we have uh, a new traffic circle we're going to build out on the north. One minute. Yes, sir. Just out on the northeast corner of the, of the city. We have uh, some other equipment that we're buying so that we can do some of our uh, repairs and maintenance on our own. Because every time we need maintenance, it's at summertime and everybody else needs maintenance. So we're going to try to do that on our own. Uh, again, I'm... I suppose I could go on for another hour, but I won't. But I thank you very much. Again, I, it, it's really great. And I, I thank you for making the opportunity available to me for one thing, but also for what you guys are doing and letting everybody have, have a, uh, uh, an interest and a uh, degree of effort into this operation. And thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to quit. 
We appreciate you, and that's it's it's amazing talking to elected officials. It seems like every one of them gets a master class in how the water system works in these areas, <laughs> um, and it's you know it's, it makes sense because that is basically what makes us a functional civilization. In a lot of ways, is just being able to have water at our house, and that's and that's bread and butter right there. Um, well, appreciate you being on, and um, thank you much. And uh, how can someone contact you? you if they want to talk to you more. Oh, you know what I mean? Um, let you unmute and say that real quick. Sorry. There we go. Uh, how they can contact me, uh, my not name, phone number, and email address is on the city website. It's available at cityofjeffersonga.com. You can call the city hall in Jefferson and I can assure you, everybody in City Hall can tell you how to get a hold of me. There you go. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, all right. And our uh, Miss Maddox, are you username three six one six seven? Wave if that's you. I think it's you. Yep. Okay. There we go. It's always fun trying to figure out how these things work here. There we are. Um, so Don Maddox is also running for the same position, um, and this is Jefferson Ward 2, and I will, the floor is yours, Ms. Maddox. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm happy to join on. This is my first experience in running for public office, and um, so everything is very new to me, learning a lot, and um, just- Can you bring that a little closer to your, to you? It's very, you're very low. Is that a little better? Oh, a lot better. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Um, just just learning a lot in um, this endeavor to serve the public. But um, for me personally, I've been in Jackson County since 1995, and um, my husband was born and raised here. Our family owns Maddox Feed and Seed in Jefferson, and we've been a part of the city um, and that with a small family business as well as um, serving the city um, for 20. 23 years now. We have five children and two have graduated from Jefferson, three are currently in the school system. And up until now I have, and I'm still a full-time mom, but um, with everybody driving except for the last one, I've got a lot of time now to um, reach out and serve in different ways. So um, when we moved into the, back into the city in um, 2016, I began attending city council meetings and I've been doing that for four and a half years now and listening and learning a lot and really just listening because I cared about the people who um, came to the podium, who brought forth their needs and then also cared about um, our councilmen. And I just um, have honestly been in um, prayer for our city and for our council members, just um, praying for the best for um, our citizens and council members. Um, so I, I did, I started there and then um, for my background, um, besides being a mom, I've served at, um, I've taught preschool and taught in Jefferson City Schools. I'm currently a substitute teacher in Jefferson City Schools, which is extremely challenging to te um, teach children from ages kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. So one day you might get a hug and then the next day, you know, you may not be liked very much, but that's, you know, kind of roll with the punches. Um, and I uh, also mentor children through legacy youth mentoring um, in Jackson County and Jefferson City Schools. And I have went through training for our dog to teach her to be a therapy dog. So she now goes with me on therapy visits. We were at George Walton Academy last week, which was an amazing visit. They had had their um, testing for college entrance and the kids were stressed out. So they called us and asked us to come in to bring um, a little bit of peace to the kids. So when they came out, they would see our dog lady and the kids just immediately, you know, were stress-free and got to love on our little dog and she likes to lick so that they got kisses back. And um, so I just, I enjoyed, I enjoyed taking her through that program, but then learning from me as well, how to be a, a pet parent was was really an interesting adventure because she's very smart. I just had to learn how to speak her lang language and and then get to use her in that capacity. 
and we're actually a therapy team. So um, where she can't ask any questions, I can. And then she just gets to be love on legs to, to those little kids or, or any um, child of any age. We also get to go to retirement facilities as soon as COVID restrictions lift. But that's um, something that I really enjoy doing too, um, being, being able to work with children and, and even adults in, in that uh, capacity. Um, as far as your, I, I'd seen your questions earlier and we spoke briefly about that. Um, I, I noticed um, that you had said we had, there were many, many areas where we thought things weren't done right. And then were there some that we thought were done right? And recently visiting Duluth, the city of Duluth, and, we're, and so I'm speaking from city council um, perspective, but the city of Duluth is just a, and I grew up in Buford, so we, we would go to Duluth and Buford in Duluth were small, just as small as Jefferson is now, if not smaller. And Duluth did not have anything to offer where downtown Duluth sits now. And I, I really like going there and seeing their amphitheater, how they have taken um, their very small main street, similar to Jefferson's, it's, um, it is small too. But there are um, lovely shops on, on their streets, um, a variety of restaurants. There's with the um, amphitheater, which I know Jefferson has thought about bringing in in the future, the opportunity to have events and bring um, community into downtown so that they can, you know, enjoy the restaurants and enjoy the downtown um, atmosphere, especially something um, where we're speaking of, there's so much that is new. I think people really enjoy, use, enjoy the historical part of Jefferson coming into downtown and, um, walking the streets, being part of a smaller community. I think that's the, the feel that Jefferson has and that draws so many people here. And I think that was part of your set, one of your other questions um, with, with the growth that's coming here. You know, what will we, what will we do to, um, to make sure that we have good growth and to not, um, to not allow um, warehouses or, or things in that, that don't really help our communities. But um, so I do believe that Jefferson needs to work to bring um, ordinances in um, so that we bring it, we are able to have good retail. I know Mr. Grantley spoke about that. We do need, we definitely need more retail places to spend our money as a mother of five and living in Jefferson for, um, or raising kids here for 24 years, I would have given anything to have been able to buy a pair of shoes for my child in the city. So um, I, not that I, I want a lot of box chain stores, but a, a place where we could go if I could get a uniform shirt and a pair of shoes or socks for my kids, things like that. If thinking from a mom's perspective, I would really like that to happen. Um, so I, th I think we do need to monitor what kind of growth we have come in and, and how much, um, but I do think that we uh, need, gosh, everybody, everybody that you talk to wants to know when we're gonna get a new restaurant, especially in the city of Jefferson. We need a, another restaurant. We're sick of pizza and Mexican. And <laughs> so um, I, it would be nice to, to work, to, to get some of those, oh, a Chick-fil-A would be fantastic, to get some of those um, restaurants in to, to make the citizens happy and a place to spend their money. Um, and then one of your other questions that Mr. Gramley spoke to was about um, the racial violence. And um, I, I just immediately, when I read that, I reached out to Janice Mangum um, and the question stated that the Jackson County had a, a long or legacy of racial violence. And um, so I just reached out to her and asked if she knew of that, um, if that was something that she encountered or if that was an issue that she saw. And, and just per her words, she said that no, um, she had no such knowledge or statistics showing that um, currently racial violence um, existed here now or in her tenure as sheriff that she experienced that. And I just, one thing that I really appreciated about um, that is that when I saw the question, I could pick up my phone and I could text my sheriff and she answered me immediately. And I appreciate that about Jefferson and Jackson County that we do live in such a blessed place where you see Janice Mangum um, 
everywhere. You see her in our schools, you see her at local functions. She was just at a wonderful function. Um, actually, I think it was just John Howell. I'm not sure if she was able to attend, but Jefferson Church worked with St. Paul um, Church and brought the two churches together at um, the city park at, um, in Jefferson and brought the two communities together down on Gordon Street and Pine Street. And I thought that was wonderful where we had an evening of praise and worship and um, one church led did the music and one church did the, the chorus and it was just fantastic to see the blending of communities and and I think that really speaks to that fact that especially as Mr. Gramley said in in the city of Jefferson we just don't you know we're very blessed we don't have those issues everyone is seen um, for who they are and they are loved and and I know so many teachers and um, local leaders that reach out to children across the board and, and try to help anyone out. And I, I just really appreciate that about our, our small town. Um, also, I think you spoke about, or one of the questions were uh, housing and how would we be able to afford, you know, let our, our people who have 20 to 25 hour, 20, 20 to 25 dollar an hour jobs, how can they afford a $300,000 home? Well, the answer is they can't. And I know for my children, my two that are grown, um, one who works for Jackson EMC, he's a lineman. And then my daughter works for Wander Insurance Agency. They have to rent homes for, for a period of time until they're able to buy. So our daughter's currently renting and saving her money. And our son was able to save his. And I think he was able to purchase the last house in Jefferson that was under $200,000 about six months ago. So that, I mean, that is, that is nice that he was able to do that, but Jefferson does have a wide variety of homes for, for rent. And Mr. Gramley spoke of the new apartment complex going in. I know that townhomes were spoke of in regards to the senior, um, the senior neighborhood that is going in at the, behind Northminster. And I, I don't know that the townhomes were approved, but I do think townhomes are a wonderful um, addition because they're kept so nicely and the grounds are kept. I think people want to make sure that whatever is brought in would be a compliment to the city and not a burden. Um, and then as far as what I see for Jefferson, what we're looking at in the future, um, in the next 10 years, I, I had said that um, we would need to be competitive with wages. It's same that you had said, I know one of our, um, workers at the water department, he rents a home um, that um, is very reasonable, but it's not the norm for Jefferson. So it's much lower than what m most people rent in Jefferson. And, um, but he works for our water department and his complaint was that, you know, in working for the water department, and I consider him an essential worker just as I would the police or the fire department, because if we don't have water, we can't, we can't function in our city. So um, I would like to, as Mr. Grimley had said, it would, I would really like to delve into the budget and see where we could find funding to, to have officers come in and stay in in the city of Jefferson and to provide for our um, water employees as well so that they, he could actually afford to live in the city. Um, and with the apartments going in, my only concern with those is with uh, the rate I know that the apartments, uh, the reti retirement apartments at Sycamore Heights, uh, I believe the rent there is, is quite high. I don't know that everybody could afford rent like that, but um, it would be nice to have some apartments that are there, just like for my children, if they wanted to live in the city, um, stay close to us, um, that they could afford if they wanted to, to rent around here. But rent is, as well as mortgages are very, very high right now. Property values are extremely high as well. Right. Um, Close down on one minute here. I think we had a. Okay. Uh, well, if anybody would like to reach out to me, um, you can do so. I have um, my email account is Don Maddox, the number four city council at gmail.com. You can also find me at um, www.facebook.com forward slash Don Maddox for the city for city council. And then I have 
um, against good wisdom, <laughs> giving out my phone number to everybody because that's just um, the easiest way to get in touch with me. And my phone number is 770-530-7007 and text or call anytime if, if you have questions for me. Like I said, I am new to this and I'm sure I will make lots of mistakes, but I hope um, that the same grace I show to others will be shown to me. Absolutely there. And um, I, I'm actually disappointed that you're, uh, you don't have your puppy on here for me to see right now. She's that. she's in the corner taking a nap, but I could bring ah, her around. Ah, <laughs> there we go. Well, that's because that's, I, I kicked my dog out because it's not that I saw. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, oh, we are. Uh, Thank you so much for taking part in this. And this is, uh, it's been very interesting and I we wish you luck there. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate Thanks. it. Um, all right. Um, so shifting over to the west side of the county, we are going to hear from two of our Houston mayoral candidates. Um, our first is going to be uh, Ms. Lauren O'Leary. Stop that and find the unmute button for you. I think I got it. There we go. All right. Hey, Pete. Well, Hello, neighbors. How are you guys? Hopefully good. So um, just to introduce myself, my name is Lauren O'Leary, and I am one of the two Hush mayoral candidates. Um, lived here for a little over two and a half years. So um, not long ago, well, maybe about eight months or so, I started showing a little bit more interest in the community and I wanted to learn a lot. And I met some great folks who had been here for a really long time and started kind of, you know, giving me the history of Houston. And so then I decided that perhaps I would have a lot of asset to bring to the city. Um, I have two children. I've been married for almost 12 years um, and we love Houston. We found Houston and we absolutely loved it. So we were here. Um, so a couple of things that I would like to really see happen that I think would better our community. Um, one would be transparency. So what I mean by that is one thing that really bothers me about our council meetings is typically you speak at the beginning and then the topic is brought to the table and our council members maybe discuss it for maybe two minutes and then it's a vote. So things like that um, don't really allow for transparency. And just the more I talk to people, the more I see that they feel the same way. I think that there should be more uh, conversations with our council members while they are um, figuring out what it is that's best for our community. So, um, and then after that, I feel like we should have the opportunity to speak before um, any voting is made. And I think a lot of that and a lot of people would feel more like our opinions mattered and feel a little bit more valid, validated if that were the case. So that's one thing that I would really like to see change. And I know a lot of people can, you know, agree with that. So another thing that I don't see a lot of that I would like to see more of is collaboration. And when I say that, like for an example, if a decision is made in Houston and it's going to impact more than just Houston, it's also going to impact Brasselton or the county or, you know, lots of different folks. And I think that we need to spend more time building relationships with our surrounding communities um, organizations that, you know, impact us, the Board of Education, Emergency Services, DOT, we have Highway 53 right here. So I think we need to start building more working relationships because if we work together at large, we'll be able to see what would be the best, you know, solution for everyone instead of just your city. So I think that would be a really great step to take. Um, another thing that's kind of a hot topic in Jackson County altogether, but especially um, in Houston, so developer accountability, um, hot topic. So we all know how development works. They come in, develop the land, make their money, and then they're gone. And, um, you know, we have to figure out a way to 
make them assist us in mitigating the cost of all of our, you know, growth. They bring it to us. We'll need upgrades and expansion and maintenance. So we got to start holding them accountable for their fair share. Um, just an example of, you know, poor developer accountability would be, we have two neighborhoods right here down the street um, and they are literally flooding. So when there's rain, quail run and deer creek, they flood and not just like a little bit of water. So these homeowners are having to pay out of pocket to make repairs to their um, property and their land. And it's just one of those where, you know, we have rights as current property owners. So we need to make sure that our rights are being defended just like the developers and you know, our newer residents, their rights are being defended. So that's, that's important as well. Um, managing growth, I know that some other folks have talked on it already, but one thing that is very important with all the growth that we have coming is going to be um, just managing it to where it balances out. So we need a healthy mix of both residential and business, because if we're only doing residential, then we're never going to be able to pay for our city. So we need those businesses too, to help, you know, bring in extra revenue so that we can afford it. Um, so that's something that definitely needs to be taken into consideration before we're approving and approving and approving. Um, and some of it was approved by our last administration. Um, so another big one that's a hot topic right now is city tax. So we don't currently pay a city tax, but you know, the recent purchases that we've been doing, for instance, we are restarting our police department and that is going to end up being a huge expense for us. Now, not that I'm against having police department because I'm not, I think it's great. I just don't think that we were ready to finance one. Um, I mean, we paid $650,000 just for the rundown building and the half acre and um, impact fees. They kept telling us impact fees are paying for it. Well, no, impact fees aren't paying for all of it. Um, you know, only 56% could go towards the police station with our current population. And the police cruiser, it's not a um, considered uh, capital improvement. So we couldn't use impact fees on that. So operations 401ks, it's just, in my opinion, I don't think it was the right time. I think we could have spent money on many more important things such as roads or um, just many, many more important things that I could think of. And one more thing is one of your questions I actually found pretty interesting. Let me find how it was worded real quick. I wrote it down somewhere. Okay. Um, so paraphrasing, what can we do to allow folks to spend money here? Well, we just started up the DDA. Well, not just, but here recently started up our DDA. So I'm sure everybody here has been to Houston. Um, we have a pretty rundown little city. So we have our DDA that's coming in and they're going to help spruce it up. And I'm hoping to see local restaurants or, you know, local stores, a lot of local, that would be important, but that would be to where our current residents and our oncoming, upcoming residents, they have a place to spend money. Because right now we don't really have any stores or restaurants where we are bringing money back into our city. So I think the DDA is going to do really great, spruce it up, you know, give us some somewhere to go because most of our business, everybody takes to Brasselton. Brasselton's got a great downtown area, some great restaurants. So instead of taking it to Brasselton, I would like to see us keep it right here in Houston. So I liked that question. That was a good question. Um, and the only other thing going back to the city taxes, if we don't start watching what we're spending our money on, we are gonna to have to start paying that city tax because Mission does, we just don't have enough in our community to be able to pay for it. Um, so those things are a lot of things that I'm worried about and I would like to see some changes made. I'd like to have a voice at the table. Um, I've been talking to a lot of residents going to neighborhoods for the past couple of months and 
we have some really good folks in Houston with a lot of input. So I think we need to spend a lot of time getting their input and giving everybody a voice. And that's it. Oh, you're muted. There we go. Oh, there you are. Well, thank you there. Um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to enter in here? Um, I will say that the, uh, I ended up spending a lot of time personally in Houston a couple of years ago. Um, there there some issues with the, uh, the previous, previous um, administration there. Um, and the, um, I think some people to um, really, um, I do want to get in a, just your, your thoughts about how you would make that city in particular a welcoming place and reassure people that have saw the name Houston in the news a lot about three or four years ago that it is a welcoming place and it is a place that everyone is welcome to live and feel comfortable. Right, yes. So Houston is not the same place it was 10 years ago. It's not even the same place it was five years ago. We have a lot of newcomers coming. We have a lot of growth going on. There's much more diverse people moving in, a lot more ethnicities moving in, and younger folks. We have a lot of new a lot of new people coming and a lot of it is more aimed towards younger folks that I have seen. So it's just, we need to learn to embrace it and use it to our advantage because a lot of these people have different backgrounds, different um, knowledge. It's something that we could really all use to benefit us as far as like, you know, citizen committees. One thing I would like to see is the planning and zoning. I am a huge advocate of us reinstating our planning and zoning because it was dismantled um, several months ago. So having all these new diverse people who have fresh eyes and you know can come in and see things with a new perspective, I think that's great. I think we can use their talents. Um, they can have input on how they have seen things or where they just came from and give us a lot of ideas. So we need to embrace them coming in, not shun them or make them feel like outsiders we need to embrace everybody yeah absolutely that's something i a few years ago when we were um part of that recall effort there that is one thing that was very much noticed there's a in the a lot of the newer subdivisions you had a lot of younger folks but also folks that had no real tie to the community in a lot of ways they had no idea anything was even going on because they they lived there and worked somewhere else and um, yeah um I guess one other question here too coming in, um, how, how do you see yourself, if you were to be elected, how do you see the relationship between the council and the mayor and um, in that, and how, how, how do you see yourself interacting with, with the council? Okay, so I am not there to make friends. I'm not going to sit at a pretty table. So I am going to go in there, you know, voice my thoughts, my opinions, speak with the community, have their opinions heard, so as far as other council members not wanting to work with me or wanting, that's, that's up to them. If they're there for the right reasons, then they are going to want to work together to make what is best for our community, those types of choices. And that's what I plan to do. So if the other council members decide that that's how they want to do, then I think that's great. I say, let's work together. All right. Um, we have another question here asking, um, uh, what is your stance on the rhetoric of the phrase, don't win at our Jackson? What does that phrase mean to you? We actually, I think I may even be a member on, on Facebook. I'm not sure, but there is a Facebook page going around about don't win at our Jackson. And um, basically on that Facebook page, a lot of people don't want to see growth. They do not want to see overcrowding. And I don't either. I don't want to see overcrowding growth. It's, it's going to happen whether we like it or not. Um, we have to embrace it. So people are completely against any type of growth. It's coming. <laughs> Northeast is uh, booming. So I think that phrase is referring to don't add any growth, stay how we are. So, and I'm okay with some growth. I don't want to be overpopulated like Gwinnett. That's not what I want to see, but Growth is coming, so we either have to get on the train or <laughs> we're going to get ran over. So we need to be proactive. The time for reactive government is it's not going to work anymore. We're moving too quickly, so we need to be proactive. Very true. Very true. Um, all right, we've got actually about 45 seconds here. So um, 
unless there's any other questions um thank you so much for taking part thank of you. our thank you thanks guys here. and uh thank you for uh it's always good when we see new people coming into the system same thing for mismatics yeah. as well as like seeing new new faces that are have been private citizens in the past which every one of these people they were talking yeah. to at one point, at one were point. Citizens here. so uh that is taking being part of the process whether or not running or just being here actually everybody on this call is a it's a huge thing to be an active citizen. This is something where I get on my soapbox sometimes and I'll show up in a second. But it's, <laughs> um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of times we have, everybody has issues with money and politics. And the reason that money is such an issue in politics is because most folks don't take the time out on a Thursday night to sit and listen to what the water system's like in Jefferson or what the, or there's flooding in Houston or these issues and, um, or, and if we actually we wait for it to passively come to us through ads and usually attack ads because that's what works well instead of sitting here and having good discussions about things so thank you everybody for being on this call first of all and thank you as well uh mayor cell i think i saw you on here let's go ahead and look the floor over to you good evening can you hear me Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm, I'm somewhat no needed. I'm somewhat okay. needed Zoom calls. Usually somebody else handles them for me. <laughs> Pete, we've never met, but thank you for having me here tonight. Absolutely. Glad for you to join us. So I am uh, Shannon Sale. I am uh, the current mayor of the city of Houston. Took office about 18 months ago, March of 2020. Um, after all basically all our previous people either resigned or got voted out of office. I have, uh, I've grow, I grew up here. I'm actually a local. Um, my parents have been here. My grandparents have been here, aunts, uncles, family's been here for a couple hundred years. So we, um, I know the city of Houston. I know the history of Houston. Uh, I know where we came from. I know where we're going. Um, my, um, my thought on Houston is when I took office, basically nothing had been done in Houston for 18 months. And we had a uh, development dropped in our lap of uh, 2,600 homes and another 300 um, townhome community, almost 3,000 homes that we had to get ready for. We have worked extremely hard. Our council, we worked as a team, our staff, and City of Houston has met the challenge. And I mean, I can say that we're really proud of it, what we've done. We've done a major uh, sewer expansion plant to um, uh, an expansion to the sewer plant to upgrade enough capacity to take care of our immediate needs. Rolling right into our next expansion, uh, we got the allotment from EPD today. Um, we uh, started construction on a water tank uh, two, three weeks ago. The foundation's in on it. It'll be the first of one of two that are planned here for the next two years. So we've been busy making sure that you've got water pressure, you've got water volume, uh, that everybody in the city is being taken care of. I think in general, people take water and sewer, you know, kind of for granted, because when you turn your faucet on, it's always there and you wouldn't miss it until you turned it on and it didn't work. Uh, we, um, I heard something earlier about keeping the developers accountable. In September of last year, the city of Houston adopted an impact fee program. And we are receiving, I think it's about $2,800 per home. And there are different rates once, once it gets into commercial property. This is a 20 year program. It'll bring in approximately $20 million to the city of Houston. It's used for parks and recreation. It's used for police and it's used for fire. It is taking a good bit of the burden off the taxpayer and putting it on the new homeowners. People say the developer pays it, yeah, he writes the city the check, but at the end of the day, it's the homeowner paying it. It's the newcomer paying it. The newcomer is uh, 
paying the water tap fees, the sewer tap fees. That is what we are building water tanks with. That's what we're building sewer expansion plants with. Our city, we've held a few town, town hall meetings. We, when I ran for office a year and a half ago, the police department was a top topic. And I, the mayor, the, myself and the council, we answered the call and we decided we would start the police department back up again. We have not had a police department for about 10 years. And it did, it about broke the city of Houston. We are keeping very close tabs on the cost of the, of the uh, police department. We have one officer. We are still setting up all the uh, court system. We're still trying to get all the radios and the lights in the car, but we're progressing. We have bought a police station. Yes, about 57% of the cost of that came from impact fee money. So it was the overall cost to the taxpayer was actually less than half. Uh, this year, we did also form a new downtown development authority, the DDA. Extremely pleased to get this uh, started. It was a um, it was a uh, goal of mine to get that done, and we put them together. I think late spring. We've got a good team on there, and we've already kind of assigned them some projects to start getting to work on. And I think in the next few years, you're gonna see a major transformation in the town of Houston. Finally, we have the rooftops that are bringing businesses to Houston. And, you know, growth, er, nobody wants the traffic, but everybody wants the Publix and the Walmart and the Home Depot within walking distance. And, and we do, we all want that, but it's, that's not a uh, feasible, logical um, way to think because you got to have the rooftops to get the businesses there. Uh, they just can't invest the money without the customers. We are doing our best to, um, to improve the traffic flow in Houston with some cart pass through some existing subdivisions, some new subdivisions. So we really kind of hope <clears throat> very soon, the next two to five years, that we're going to have a major cart path system through Houston to where if you live in one of the subdivisions or downtown, you can get to a park, you can get to a uh, grocery store, you can get to restaurants without having to get in your automobile and drive down Highway 53. And we're, we're, we're pretty excited about that. Um, I've told people one thing that's coming, the developers have told us this is a done deal. We're going to have a Publix in, uh, in downtown Hush. And I say downtown and on Highway 53, corridor uh, right next to the uh, Coulter Crestwind Twin Lake development. Um, I just heard something also, whether Houston was a welcoming town. I think you asked that question. They, if you were here at our fall festival three weeks ago, it, we had a record number of booths. I think there were 175 booths. I would gather to say there could have been close to 10,000 people in the city of Houston on that Saturday afternoon during the parade, because I was in the parade and went down the street. And again, I grew up here in the parades and the difference in, you know, every year over the last 50 years is tremendous. We, um, we do have a good mixture of people moving into Houston, young and old alike. Uh, I want to make sure everybody's aware that our Crestwinds development has 1,300 homes in it that are all 55 and older. And uh, so that's, you know, we're, we're getting the young people, but we're also getting the retirees. And uh, 1,300 homes is not a small, small number. So we're really happy to have that. Um, I have great relationships with our counties, with our cities. The mayors of all the cities, we meet together once a month to discuss what's going on in each city. We, uh, we stay in constant contact with Jackson County, uh, even with some other cities. Uh, government's good about sharing ideas. That is one thing that I've been really happy with. Everybody has had the same problem you're having today, and it's easy to get an answer of how did you address it from another city. So 
And I really look forward to serving in the city of Houston for a complete full term. Uh, it's been a uh, honor to serve them. Uh, I love being a part of this town and helping mold our future. I think we are definitely headed in the right way. I, um, I put 25 to 30 hours a week in at City Hall and we are in meetings constantly on planning and what's gonna happen for our future and what's best for our residents. And we, I invite, the entire council invites, the city staff invites, any resident of Houston to contact us directly. We are happy to talk to you. We're happy to answer your questions. The city of Houston is transparent. There are no secrets in City Hall. I can promise you that. We are, we are filmed. We are documented on every meeting. There, are, there is nothing in Houston that, uh, that the public can't find out. And again, Pete, thank you for having me tonight. I'll be glad to take questions. You get myself unmuted there. Thank you very much there. And if anybody has questions, please send those in there. Uh, I'm glad to hear you say that, um, that you are talking to other cities there. I'm a system administrator by trade, which is working with computers. And the reason you get into that business is because you're lazy and you want the computer to do the work for you, not not yourself. So if you can find examples and how other people addressed it, I'm a big believer in that. Um, and I think we got a lot of the Jefferson Council here and they've heard me on my soapbox about Peachtree City and their car path um, um, way. They've got car paths all through Peachtree City. So hearing that that's connecting to Brownstone and something on y'all's radar is very good. I'm a I like that idea a lot personally. Um, I used to make fun of her when I go visit her over in Peachtree City because there was they had their little car, little golf carts parked everywhere. And then more times we visited, it turned out to be a really good solution for a lot of the issues there. Um, let's see. Um, if there's any questions coming in, um, let's see. I actually will go ahead and uh, since this was asked of um, asked Miss Looney there, uh, the there's this phrase that says, uh, don't go in at our Jackson. What does that mean to you? And what is what and how how do you address that? Okay, so I don't see my picture anymore. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so I read that in the paper and I see it on online quotes. You know, and I, I think that's a double edged sword. You know, Jackson County, you get out of Brazelton and Houston, the west side of the county. I mean, uh, Jackson County is a rural county. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mostly farmland. And um, I'm a pilot, I fly over it fairly often. It, uh, there's no shortage of raw land in Jackson County. Now the west side here, definitely it's growing like crazy. People say don't go into uh, Jackson County. Number one, you've got to have public sewer in the county on every road to get high density developments. Mm -hmm. Jackson County Water and Sewer Authority does not have that. There is very little public sewer in the county. And I used to build and develop 20 years ago. In Jackson County, if you're not on sewer, you had to put septic tanks in. Um, it was a minimum size lot of three quarters of an acre. So, and that I believe that still is today's rule. And we're under almost a year moratorium as Jackson County, I believe, is, is looking to do impact fees. Matter of fact, I think Jackson County is going to kind of model their impact fees somewhat after what the city of Houston did. But people say, don't go at our Jackson. You know, a million people live in Gwinnett County, all by choice. So some way I ask, what is so wrong with Gwinnett County when a million people choose to live there. They have some of the finest schools in the state. They have one of the greatest park systems in the state. They have shopping and restaurants just about within walking distance, I would say of the majority of housing. Mm -hmm. I, so I think there's a lot of positives in Gwinnett, but those positives bring the people and it brings the traffic. I think for sure you're going to see Jackson County grow. 
I mean, our geographic location, I believe we have five exits on Interstate 85 that go through Jackson County. Yep. It, it is inevitable that Jackson County is going to get highly populated from the cities to the county itself. Yeah. You can control it and mold it and see what you think when that county is done wrong and try not to do that here. But I think, will we have a million people in Jackson County in 30 to 50 years? One minute. I think that is, uh, I think that's highly possible. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I, I have loaded up my kids and went to, Jack, to Gwinnett for a lot of park situations and a lot of stuff. I actually work over, the, over in Lawrenceville. So I'm, I'm in Gwinnett all the time. And I, I agree. I, I think there's a lot of good things there. And I'm not sure exactly what the, I actually, I think I do know what the undertone is of some of those those comments, but um, yeah. Um, gosh. um so we are at um, time is up. I want to thank you so much for being part of this, um, Marcel, and um, uh, hope we can speak again sometime. Thank you, Pete. Gosh. Let me just mute that. All right. So now we are going to go all the way over to the other side of the county here, and we are, um, Mr. Rollins here is, is uh, he does have an opponent, but Mr. Gaitheride did not respond to our request to have him be on. So uh, we're going to give uh, Andre Rollins, who is running for Commerce Ward, Run, uh, Ward 1, uh, the floor here. And um, Andre should be able to unmute, and um, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Pete, and, and uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you for everybody for attending tonight. First of all, I'd like to say I'm a boy of commerce, born and raised in commerce. Um, I was fortunate enough in 1980 to uh, get an opportunity to leave commerce for about 25 years. I went to recruit, I was recruited by the FBI, and I went to Washington, D.C., and lived in the Washington metropolitan area about 25 years. And uh, after the bombing, uh, bombings on November, on September 11th, my wife and I decided it was time to come home. Uh, on that day, my wife called me. She was working in Arlington, Virginia, near the Pentagon. And she called me and she said, uh, Andre, you told me they bombed New York. Why do I see smoke here in Virginia? I said, well, they also bombed the Pen Pentagon. And we only lived uh, two miles from Andrews Air Force Base. And uh, I knew that there was ever a war we were in a bad location. So we made a conscious decision to move back to Commerce, Georgia. And I moved back into Ward 1 where I was born. Uh, I can throw a rock from my house to where I was born. Um, there's, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't say I was a reluctant candidate, but I saw some things that made me get into the race. Uh, I actually qualified on the last day of qualifying on the last hour. I never even got up to tell my wife I was going to run for office. Again, because I saw some things that I had to correct. I actually called City Hall on the 18th of August, which was the last, like I said, date, last day of qualifying. I called at 2.30 uh, to find out who would be running for office. And when I was told, I recognized that one of the persons running for office actually didn't even live, first of all, didn't live in the Ward 1. Second, didn't even live in Jackson County. So I thought it was my responsibility because, because again, no one else had, had, had brought that to the attention of anybody. I thought it was my responsibility to get involved. So um, I went down to city hall and I qualified to run for city council. There are several issues facing commerce over the, over the next several years that uh, must be addressed. First of all, housing in commerce. I hear you all talking about the housing in Jefferson and your apartments. Well, that's something Commerce doesn't have a whole lot of our apartments. And we're not building any apartments in Commerce. I've served on the planning committee for the last 12 years. I'm currently vice chairman of the city planning commission. And we're, we're not building any starter housing. Uh, and to the degree that bothers and that concerns me, because we really don't have anything for our young people to come back to. Go off to college, there's, there's really no housing for them in Commerce. Matter of fact, I was looking in the paper today, I have something here, which I'm holding up here. This shows 27 people being evicted out of their apartments in commerce. 
And I'm wondering why. Uh, there's a lot of that going on here in commerce. A lot of people uh, who are currently renters are losing their house, are losing their uh, their apartments. And I don't know why or how, but I'm, but I'm going to certainly ask some questions because this is the second or third complex in which people or renters are being evicted. Uh, again, housing and commerce is a uh, uh, is. It's, it's, re it's, it's really a, a new issue for us because we, we currently have a thousand houses on the on the books to be built out. Most, most recently, houses we had approximately 150 houses built out in my ward. So my ward happens to be the most diverse ward in commerce, and it's currently the ward I think with the most new housing in. It. And I spent the last um, two weekends out knocking on doors and meeting and meeting people in these communities, and these the these new communities that we have in commerce for the most part, these are not people who upgrade their houses. These are people who moved here from, for the most part, out of state. I met uh, four or five couples uh, that actually moved from Gwinnett County into commerce, but the majority of these people are new people who've yet to get involved, uh, certainly with politics. They're trying to figure out where the best place to buy toilet tissue should meet. So they really haven't gotten involved yet. In, uh, in in our local community, but like we're building houses, but these are how these are single family homes for the most part for families. Uh, a starter home in commerce is going to be someone buying an older house and rehabilitating it. So I'm looking to to work with people and and, and work with within the, within the system and, and find grants to help uh, young people and to, to and to re rehabilitate their older housing in commerce. The second problem, uh, second issue in commerce is growth and how to deal with growth. Again, uh, the Planning Commission, I think, in commerce has done a good job in terms of, of managing and working with uh, with builders coming into commerce, and we, we did a pretty good job with growth. But we're at the point now where our growth is about to explode. Uh, we have, again, a thousand houses on the, on the books to be built out. All we have to do is apply for uh, uh, building permits don't have to come back before the city council. Uh, and again, these houses are being built out right, right now. Throughout our city, we have single homes being built out on, uh, on individual lots. And uh, Commerce, again, is really experiencing the growth that we're starting to experience the growth that the west end of the county had. But again, we, we, we as a city are prepared for it. Uh, I have the experience that I've learned uh, from 12 years on the planning commission dealing with this. And I, again, I think commerce is situated to grow, but we have to deal with the problem we're all having in terms of infrastructure, uh, water, sewage. I know that uh, the most of the commerce infrastructure is very old um, and people don't understand quite often, like, like on my street, we have a uh, area where we quite often have water, uh, water main breaks. And I finally found out the problem is these water mains were dug by hand years ago, and they're not very deep. And when uh, when a big truck, uh, specifically uh, some of the city trucks passing over these roads, sometimes they burst the water main. So again, our infrastructure is old, but it's something we've got to deal with. And I hope that we're prepared. I know I'm prepared to push our city council once I'm elected to get in line to get some of that inf infrastructure money that we hope is coming down the pike. Because again, we can't grow without the proper infrastructure. But again, I, I think that the, as a uh, as a city, I'm, I, I think I'm going to be able to work with the uh, with the currently uh, elected officials, and we will certainly, uh, to the best of our ability, make sure that commerce is is in line to receive uh, uh, infrastructure dollars when they come when it when it comes available. Um, economic development commerce is going to be another major major issue over the next several years. Uh, the SK battery plant is really, really changing the dynamics in terms of commerce. Uh, I know people who have uh, went from an $8 an hour job to a $20 an hour job by going to the battery plant. That is life changing. That is true, truly, truly life changing. But at the same time, uh, the battery plant, I think is going to force commerce to really deal, deal with some issues that we're probably not prepared to deal with. Uh, I know that uh, there's some concern as it relates to the impact on the school system and the fact that they really don't pay a, a tax. They have what's called a pilot, 
the payment in lieu of taxes. And I know that our school superintendent was concerned that we were probably not getting what we should get. But again, I think those are things that as a as a council, once we get on, I, once I get on, I will learn more about that. And we may have to, again, readdress uh, some of the things we've done, if we can, with the battery plant. Again, the battery plant is going to be the largest economic driver here in our town. It's going to bring many, many more suppliers. It's going to bring many, many more jobs here. And with jobs come people. And and uh, a lot of my a lot of my uh, older constituents, or or I should older resident comers, were concerned about uh, the impact on crime in our town. And I hope that uh, that's something that we will have to deal with. I know as we grow, uh, as other cities grow, crime is always an issue, but I think it's something that we're prepared to deal with. And I think down the line, we will, we will be fine once once we uh, we recognize and we're able to, to develop the proper programs and plans to deal with the growth. Um, another thing that, uh, we have it hasn't been addressed in commerce. The fact that we lost our hospital, and that's very concerning to me. I actually had to go to uh, the hospital about two months ago. I got dehydrated. I ended up in the uh, in the emergency room there in Browson. It's a beautiful hospital, and the experience was positive, considering the fact that I really didn't want to go to the hospital during the period of COVID. But again, I had a good experience, but my wife had to take off work in order to take me to the hospital. Ordinarily, I would have driven over to BJC or North, uh, most recently Northridge in about two minutes and I could have probably could have handled it myself. But again, that's that's one of the areas that I haven't heard any politicians discuss the fact that we've lost our hospital and I heard, haven't heard any plans from any elected official in commerce or otherwise uh, in terms of what we're going to do about that, uh, I'm I'm for at this point pressing the city to, to make sure that we're in contact with the leaders of Northeast Georgia Health System Piedmont because the least we can have, the least we should be demanding, is a 24 by 7 urgent care facility with uh, diagnostic for X-rays uh, to do screens of different sorts, uh, all type of diagnostic testing. So that should be the direction that we should be as a city. And once we get on as a council, uh, pushing to get the, to serve our community with a hospital. We have great economic development. We have we have these big corporations coming in. The battery plant, again, which I mentioned, a place that big is going to have problems. They're going to have accidents. There's going to be incidences. Uh, I think there's a company called Ecam, which is another company related to the uh, the battery plant. I think it will be developing acid at the further end of commerce. Uh, again, another big industrial uh, uh, project with the potential for, for workplace type injuries. But again, we still don't have a hospital and I haven't heard a single politician address that. Um, commerce again, like with the growth, our downtown starting to develop traffic problems. Uh, a couple of days ago, I wanted to do something quickly run up town to get the something before store closed. And again, traffic was backed up like I've never seen. I mean, in commerce, uh, 16 cars is a, is a traffic backup. But considering someone who's lived in Washington, D.C. and who commuted to work 16 miles a day, two hours a day, uh, I probably shouldn't be upset about traffic in commerce. But again, that's something new that we've learned, we've got, we have to learn to deal with and something that we're going to, as a town, we really don't have a whole lot of choices because we have our, our, through town, there's two lanes. It's controlled by the uh, by the Georgia DLT. And at one point, I think we were trying to get uh, get trucks rerouted around town and uh, the state didn't agree with that. So we were still left with, uh, with the traffic problem that we have and they're not gonna get any better. But again, we as a council, once I'm elected, we're gonna have to work with the state to uh, improve, work to improve our traffic problem. Um, I didn't address, uh, I think I may have addressed some of Pete's questions. He talked about, and one of the questions was about uh, race, it wasn't race relations, race incidents in my county. Well, you know, as a boy of commerce, you know, I've, I've seen 
I've seen the Klan march in our town, but I've never really experienced any real racial incidences with anybody in my town. Um, I feel sometimes when you're, you're when you're in a store and you're shopping, or people you may get uh, as a black man, you get a second look by clerks in the stores. But again, I think Jackson County's coming around. You know, we 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 have to. Uh, but again, we got to thank also thank by who the person that represents us and in the state that's Tommy Benton. And I think we we still got a long way to go in that area. And that's all I say. With that. And again. I thank you all for listening to me. Uh, my name is Andre Rollins. I'm running for city council in Commerce. Uh, this is my uh, first run at elected office. Again, I've been on the planning commission for the last 12 years. Um, I've been one who helped people in my community for the last 17 years since I came back home. People come to me unofficially for help because I do know most of the players downtown. Uh, some of them I went to school with, others we've uh, we just we know socially, and again, I've always been able to get things done here in commerce outside of the political arena. But again, I saw a need, and I tried to groom someone else to run for city council. At the last minute, they backed out on me, so here I am. Uh, again, my name's Andre Rollins. I'm from Commerce, Georgia. You can reach me at a r o l l one eight one zero four at aol dot com as well as a Andre R at commercegeorgia.org. Thank you very much. And I look forward to meeting all you all personally. And again, thank you for your time and good luck to everybody in the races. Thank you. Thank you. And, I, and you, uh, you, you mess with me because I kept having questions I was going to ask, and then you go back and actually answer that right away there. Cause that's addressing some of the issues with, uh, with that SK plant going in and, the workplace issues there and having those hospitals not there anymore is something that's that's bothered me yeah because i know we've had several accidents there that have been fairly construction you have accidents and that's you don't have accidents there. i mean you're dealing with a place building batteries acid yeah. i mean i understand that there will be three shifts with a thousand people per shift once they're operation there are yeah. going to be problems up there in terms of incidents and accidents yeah so and how they're going to cause solve that. And um, I guess my other other um, thing that comes to mind for myself is acid. And it doesn't sound like I don't know anything about making lithium batteries. But what, right. is, the, what is the environmental impact of making lithium batteries? And have we really looked at, made sure that we can do that safely as an, in an industrial level, that we're not going to end up polluting our, our streams and rivers in the area there? Because I, I grew up down in South Georgia, down in Waycross. Was the next town over from us? Uh, there are parts of Waycross you can't live anymore because of the cancer rates, and okay. that is due to facilities and a lot of the train switching operations they had in back 30s, 40s, 50s that dumped so much toxic stuff in the ground that it's they got a huge cancer um, outbreak it's, cell it's right there. Something that's, we got to be concerned about. Yeah, and I don't want that to happen here. Um, Absolutely I'm, I'm not. Proud, I'm glad for the jobs. I'm glad for people being able to be employed, and I'm excited about the changes that could come and the, the growth that could come, but then we gotta also be very concerned about the, uh, the risk there. So Absolutely. thank you so much for, for taking part here, Andre, and we'll be, uh, we'll be talking to you there. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, everybody. So we will, uh, we are um, now moving on to, um, actually, okay, we're now we're going a little bit south of here. Um, uh, Ms. Hollett, Ms. Lee Hollett. Let's go ahead and bring you up. She is running for one of the at-large seats in um, in Arcade. So we're going to make sure that she is unmuted there. Can and, you hear me uh, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right, awesome. I got the whole ear thing and I want to make sure it's working. There we go. <laughs> All Good right, so I'll introduce myself. I am Leah Hollett. I am running for Arcade City Council. Um, I have lived in Georgia for 20 years, and I've lived in Arcade specifically for 15 years. Um, I am a personal stylist and a makeup artist by profession, and I've been a stay-at-home mom for the last 16 years. I have seven children. Um, I've been married to my husband for 20 years, and um, they go to Jackson County Schools. My, I have three little guys at South Jackson Elementary School. I've got one middle schooler at East Jackson Middle and I have three kids at East Jackson High School. 
um, and I'm very involved in the schools there. I was formerly the South Jackson PTO secretary. I'm currently the East Jackson Middle School PTO president. Um, I started a student and services initiative at the schools that my kids go to where um, if there are children who don't have access to laundry facilities, whether it's um, a wash and dryer at home or at a laundromat, they can bring their laundry um, very discreetly to school and it will be washed and folded and returned to them front at, from the school facility. Um, there are a lot of issues um, in our area with poverty and um, whether you agree with it or not, food stamps will buy food, but it will not buy laundry detergent or soap or hygiene items. And that's, uh, I saw a need in our community for those things um, for, for the children. And um, I view schools as a, they have a, a responsibility to their community, not just in education, but in caring for the children physically as well as educationally. Um, and as a community member, I felt like that was something that needed to be addressed. So um, we serve the kids there as needed. Um, I am part of the Legacy Mentor Youth Mentoring Group. I actually mentor 10 students in the school system. Um, I, I asked the lady who's in charge of it, I said, how many kids can I have? And she said, well, most people only have one. I said, well, that's not what I asked you. How many kids can I have? And she said, I guess as many as you want. So I went to the counselors at the middle school and the high school and I said, okay, how many kids do you have on the waiting list? And she told me and I said, all right, give them to me. So um, I figure if I can handle seven actual children all the time at my house, I can do 10 kids part-time throughout the school. Um, and that's been really great to see um, the impact that one adult who just gives a darn can make in a kid's life. Um, so I've also been on the Parent Advisory Council for three years for the Jackson County School System, and that's been really eye-opening to see the behind-the-scenes um, look at how schools function, not only in tax revenue, but in services that they provide, and how um, education can impact a child's life for generations. Um, my husband is on the Jackson County Board of Education, so I see a lot of behind-the-scenes as far as that is. So my expertise and experience is in the school system realm, um, but realizing that that is impacted by city councils and planning commissions um, in ways that I think a lot of people don't realize until after it's already been said and done. Um, I initially um, was, was not gonna run for city council because like I said, I got a lot going on. I have seven kids and I do a lot of stuff with them and with their schools. Um, I actually am going back to college myself and taking online classes. So my plate's a little bit full, but um, over the summer, it was brought to my attention that the arcade, the current Arcade City Council um, approved a yet, yet another liquor store to come into Arcade. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the town of Arcade, but we have a very colorful history. Um, and it actually was approved for the end of my road. It's an intersection of Dewitt, Road, and 129. And there's already so much traffic that's coming from Athens, especially on a Saturday in the fall. People are going into Athens like crazy. Um, my kids actually on the home game Saturdays, we like to stand on the front porch and wait for the state patrol to escort the other team's buses past. That's how close we live to that highway. Um, and when I moved here 20 years ago, it was a Two lane road, and now it's a divided four lane highway. So, already um, in my time living here, I've seen a huge increase in, in growth and traffic. And um, I just felt like if I had a if I had a campaign slogan, which I don't, but if I did, it would we can do better. I just feel like we just because that's been our past, that doesn't have to be our future. What is the, you know, I understand the short term gains of a business like that um, would increase the tax revenue, but what is the long term legacy that we're leaving for our children, not only in the property value of the land that we'd like to leave to them when we are no longer here, um, but in the legacy of, oh, yeah, that's where I was, this is going on right here, um, that's where I was raised and that's a place I can be proud of, not a place that we joke about, well, you know, you know, arcade between Jefferson and Athens, it's the liquor stores and the speed trap. <laughs> and I just feel like we can do, we can do better than that. Um, 
So to address the questions that you sent in the email, um, you, the first question was talking about growth. Um, it's inevitable, it's coming. Um, our kids actually having a little bit of the opposite problem of some of these other municipalities surrounding us. We're not seeing the growth that other communities are. And on the one hand, when I'm sitting on my six cents acre quietly listening to the birds, I, I guess I don't mind that, except um, we, we're left with a vacuum, a, a growth vacuum. You know, if businesses aren't coming, if um, shops and services aren't coming, um, if we don't have even some industrial growth coming to this area, what's going to come in, in its place? Um, if we don't have places for people to work and shop, then they, we won't have a need for people to build and want to live here unless they want a longer commute to their, to their job. Um, I joke that I live 30 minutes from everywhere I need to be. Um, and on the one hand, I don't hate that, but like John um, had mentioned earlier as a mom, oh, it should be nice if I could just go buy a pair of shoes for my kids. That's not all the way in Commerce or Athens or Winder or Gainesville. I mean, like that's kind of where we are. Um, and so um, the growth, we're not seeing a lot of growth coming, I think, because, uh, because of our history and because of what we currently have to offer, which isn't much other than a colorful path. Um, we used to be bootleggers and moonshiners here in Arcade, and we don't have to keep being that. We can do, you know, we can make, we can make Arcade cute again. <laughs> so, um, you asked what was, what have other municipalities done right? What have they done wrong? I think that's like looking at people on Instagram or Facebook or other social media and saying, wow, they've got a perfect family. How, how do they do that? It would be hard to know. I, I know when I drive down downtown Maysville, it's really cute. Or when I'm in downtown Commerce, oh, they've got a lot to offer. It's, you know, it's hard to get over the rail or tracks and the one-way roads, but once you figure that out, like there's a lot of nice things to do there. Um, Houston, Brazelton, they've got a lot of great things to offer. Um, but again, like traffic seems to be a concern. I can look at other places and see what looks nice, but I don't know what's going on behind the scenes or what it's like to live there. So I think that um, that would be an unfair thing for me to judge fully, but from the outside looking in, I want a cute little thriving downtown. I want places for people to go, community centers, parks, civic centers, a library, a place to have events. Um, those would all be nice things to have. But again, we just, we don't have, people don't want to come here for that because we don't have much more to offer. Um, I would love to see some commercial spaces, some little restaurants or shops or services, even, you know, if there was a place where I could go to get my tires changed or my oil changed, you know, that would be convenient and, and nice to have. But I think key for us, um, I'm actually in the Facebook group, Don't Go at Our Jackson. And I think it's been, um, do I have one minute left? Is that correct? Am I reading that right? Okay, well, I'll wrap it up. Um, I would like to preserve the rural feel and the small town feel of our community because of safety issues. Um, crime rate and to protect property values. Um, I did want to touch very briefly on racial discrimination in Jackson County, if I if I could have just a couple extra seconds. Um, just because it is not my lived experience, just because I have not been racially discriminated against or haven't heard about it or hasn't been brought to my attention, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Um, and so I think in order to, a lot of people have said that this has been a safe place for them to be. Um, I think to continue away from our past and towards the growth of safety and being a welcoming to all types of people, um, we should listen to people and believe them when they say it has happened. And um, again, my name is Leah Hollett. I'm running for Arcade City Council. Um, I can be found on Instagram and Facebook by my name, Leah Stanfield Hollett, or um, my Instagram handle is confidently Leah. And I can be found by email. It's my first and my last name, Leah Hollett at gmail.com. I hate that. I start in and then realize I'm muted every time. Uh, thank you so much. I, I really feel like I actually learned something about, about Arcade here because this is living just down the road. It's one of those places I, I, I know through legend almost more than 
an actual lived experience there. And, I, and that's right, because it's there's I don't have a lot of reason to go to to arcade. Now, I would love for there to be something there to for that to be the case, because um, it yeah, other than paying the police office there when I was in college, um, going up 129 because of being stopped almost every single time I went through there, that was that was been my experience with arcade. But I think it's, it's a beautiful area. Um, I got to visit some of the churches in that area on um, last year and um, spoke with folks there. It's, it's a beautiful place. And um, thank you for running. And, um, and I appreciate you. Thank you much. Thanks um, for having me. Um, and now I believe we are going through our um, our unopposed races now, and uh, we're going back to Hushin, and we're going to talk to Dr. Fadria Sterling. She is a uh, she is a not an incumbent, but she is because she is running um, for an at large race, and there and that that seat is unopposed. I, I thought there were four seats running, and four people ran. So Dr. Sterling is. Um, should be our um, one of our next at large um, council members in Houston. So, um, Dr. Sterling, we got ten minutes there. Please tell us about yourself and um, the floor is yours. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I uh, am a native Texan. Uh, I was born and raised there. Um, my husband and I we moved to Georgia in 1984. Uh, and we lived on the south side of town, Clayton County, we moved to Gwinnett in 1990. And uh, I taught school in Clayton and in Gwinnett for 20 years. So I'm a retired educator now, and I've served children for over 37 years, uh, 20 of those uh, in Gwinnett. Um, I'm a mother uh, of four daughters and one son. I'm a grandmother and uh, I belong to Atlanta Church of Christ in Gwinnett. Uh, I'm a member of the Retired Teachers uh, of Georgia. And uh, I was raised in a small West Texas town. Uh, and uh, I love growing up there. Uh, I had a sense of community there. Um, we were involved in the community. My mother was an educator. My father was a soil conservationist and uh, he helped the farmers there uh, irrigate because in West Texas, we don't get a lot of rain. And uh, he helped the farmers irrigate their uh, farmland, you know, so their crops could grow. So um, I just truly enjoyed growing up, you know, in that small town. Um, my husband and I, we moved to Houston uh, two years ago after living in Gwinnett for a long time. Our, we are empty nesters. Uh, and uh, when I came to Houston looking around, I really loved what I saw. You know, the, the horses, the cows, the rural, uh, because... I would see that every summer when I would go down to East Texas to my dad's home. And like I said, I grew up in a small community. Uh, what I would like to bring uh, to this office is uh, a, I have a great desire to serve. Um, I'm a member of an organization, it's called Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Uh, our vice president, Kamala Harris, she is a member of that organization. And our thing, our motto is that we serve mankind. And so for 25 years, I've been a member of that and I have served. Uh, I do Relay for Life. Uh, in Gwinnett, there's a road, uh, Five Forks Trickham. That road has been adopted by our organization. Once a month I go and I help, you know, clean the trash off of Five Forks Stricken. Um, I just do a lot of things for the community and I would like to do that in Houston. Um, I don't know a lot of people in Houston, live in Brighton Park and uh, I walk 
and I've met a lot of people just by my walking, but um, I just want to serve the community. Um, number one, by leadership and guidance. And what I mean by that is learning all I can about running city government, because I've been an educator for 37 years. My thing has been working with children, doing grant writing, working on teams. Uh, so that is my background. But I would like to learn all I can about running a city. The second thing is facilitating communication between the people in the city and the city council. Uh, I think it needs to be transparent that the people need to have a voice. Um, also strive to make Houston a great place to live, but with a small town atmosphere. And everybody's been talking about, you know, the growth. Yes, um, it's growing everywhere. You know, Gwinnett, we left Gwinnett because of all the traffic and everything in Lawrenceville, that's where we live. And we came out to Houston and my husband said, well, we better enjoy this because in a couple of years, you know, it's gonna be houses on this side and houses on that side. And that has already started to happen and we've only been there two years. Uh, so um, I just think that the growth, um, it just needs to be managed. Um, I agree with um, someone who said, you know, to bring, you know, businesses to Houston. So the people of Houston won't have to go to Brazelton and spend their money. We already have uh, an industrial area down 124. Um, and so I, I just hope that I can work with the city council as a team player and learn all I can and just be a voice you know, for the community. And uh, voters can reach me um, at frederia.sterling at gmail.com. And then my phone number is 470-733-1007. All right, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Sterling there? Um, I guess um, I can say there uh, with, um, so I guess you kind of touched on it a little bit there, but we've, um, our Houston candidates, we've been asking about that, don't Gwinnett my Jackson phrase and what that means to you there. I guess we can throw that at you as well there. Well, uh, I remember coming into Gwinnett County in 1990 and uh, I remember uh, Gwinnett, no, Gwinnett Place Mall was there, but then the Mall of Georgia came some years after. Uh, and just little by little by little, you know, I just started to see everything change. But like everyone else has said, uh, many people are moving into Georgia. Uh, we've got COVID. Uh, many people are moving from California, upstate New York, because you can sell your home in those states and you can buy a nice home here in Georgia. Yeah. So, you know, all these people are coming in. So it's just up to the, the cities and the city council, you know, to work with all the different, the DOT and the community and everybody to help, you know, control the growth as best they can. Well, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate you taking the step to um, to move into the council, and um, and, I, and I look forward to seeing what what um, what um, what shenanigans you can get in there. Um, I know with I've been doing the whole political thing for a couple of years though, and I, and I think your teaching experience and dealing with children will serve you well in, the, in that capacity because um but i think but also i think the um i think it sounds like the i know some members of the Houston council and they're they're doing they're good folks so um 
Uh, so I think you'll be looking forward to see what happens there. Thank you so Thank much, you. Sarah. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, and we are going to go back over to um, my neighbor here now. Uh, Mr. Mark Wobbly is uh, the incumbent in Ward 4 in Jefferson and is lives up the road in my subdivision here. Um, so he's heard me um, moan and gripe here about my things. Let's see, is Mark still on? I'm missing him. Mark may have had to step off for a second here. So we'll just skip on over and uh, talk to Mayor Hal here. So. Hey, Pete, I, I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Yes, sir. Uh, it's great to be with you guys. And uh, thank you for uh, putting this on and allowing the candidates to express their merits for being elected. I mean, we we live in a free country that's very divisive right now. And uh, it's it's great to uh, to live in a community where, you know, my personal opinion, uh, that, that city offices are nonpartisan. <laughs> so we can just actually get things done. Um, and so primaries are a part of the equation, but uh, I just came from DC after three days and uh, met with our delegation, uh, Senator Warnock and, and Ossoff and, and also Congressman uh, uh Andrew Clyde and and man, I tell you what, uh, they they have a very different vision for the country. But I I have a vision for this for this city, and uh, I think we can be one of the the pillars of not only uh, America but also uh, in in our local communities that we can raise kids to be great Americans uh, that don't have that divisive divide. Uh, one of the things we did when we when we uh, started. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm John Howell, and uh, I'm married to uh, my better half, Emily. And I don't know why I, I don't know why women uh, agree to marry people that that are lesser lesser halves, but they somehow do. Uh, but I, I married way up, and uh, we have two girls, Georgie and Lucy, seven and nine, and. Um, we, uh, we've had a good time being a part of the city of Jefferson and, and certainly uh, the county of Jackson. So one of the things we did when we came online and, and asked to serve uh, was to let, let's create some little units that can get things done. And so we created the uh, Exit 137 Beautification Committee, which may or may not be important to my friends from Houston, Brazelton and Commerce, uh, or Maysville, but you know what? We wanna, we wanna be an economic development hub for Jackson County. And so we wanted people to feel confident when they exited 137, that that was gonna be a, a clean and, and safe place for them to, to come and, and be a part of our community. Uh, as a county seat, J Jefferson takes a little bit of a, a senior role in that, in that, in that environment. And uh, for us not to have a, a, a good looking um, exit is, is something that I wasn't proud of. So we wanted to, to pour effort into that. And we've got phase one of that, of that endeavor approved uh, with the Georgia Department of, uh, of uh, Georgia Department of uh, uh, DOT. And so we, we have been working with them to allow us Let's make that exit look good. Uh, let's let that exit look safe for people to exit on and, and, to, and to spend money in Jefferson and, and Jackson County. Uh, we've got a, a branding or rebranding committee that has finished this work for, for this time, but we're probably gonna look at it again in 2022. Uh, the, the, the current logo for Jefferson is uh, a very underwhelming logo that nobody recognizes, and we're gonna we're gonna blow past that at this point, and just and do our part and 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 make that right in 2022. Uh, we've got a an opportunity to be proactive instead of retroactive. That's what government does so many times is they find a problem and then they have to solve it. 
What I want to do is get in front of the problems and then offer solutions. Uh, and so we're doing that with our, uh, our charter modernization committee, which is our local constitution. The, the state of Georgia has its constitution. The, 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 the United States of America has a constitution. For a local community, it is your brand that is, it is being challenged uh, with, with your charters. And so we're going to try to get in front of that. Uh, my friend uh, Clint Roberts, who I think is on the call, is heading that up, and we're going to try to modernize that. And the last one is uh, we looked at doing uh, an aquatic center uh, in Jefferson, Georgia. It's a bold idea. It's an idea that when we when we uh, constituted the 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 group to look at it, and they said, you know what, uh, for sixty five thousand people, you can build an aquatic center. Well, we got 12 to 11,000 people in Jefferson. We have 65,000 people in, in the county of Jackson. And so that looked to me, looked like a, a, a county project. And so what we looked at is how do we improve the current uh, pool situation here in, in, in Jefferson, Georgia? And uh, Cody Kane has agreed to uh, head that up and he's done a, a splendid job. Uh, he has tried to expedite things when when you when you work in government, not many things get done uh, quickly, but uh, we are gathering information and we're looking towards the future and we're trying to be uh, a county uh, that is looking towards ideas and looking towards the future. And as your county seat, we're we're very honored to play our small role in that. So I would be honored, uh, Pete, uh, thank you for for uh, hosting this event. I'd be honored to take any questions and, and yield to you guys to see what you care about. And maybe we can have a little bit of a dialogue here at the end. Did it again. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat there. And I thank you for uh, being here after a long travel like that. That is, I don't know if I, I would have been able to be here. So I appreciate your, uh, your, uh, yeah, appreciate your time and being here there. Um, and um, I know that we've got um, not seeing any questions there. I uh, I do appreciate you being on here. Uh, I guess as part of that beautification progress, this may be the only annexation I can think of I would be really pushing for, but um, we can do something about that sign coming in on uh, 85 there on, on 129 with the novelty store there that's that's about my only thing but um but i do appreciate you there that and that's i think the um look forward to see what at, at the risk of taking over your meeting un, unmute people and let, let's see if we have any any All questions right. i'd love to i'd love to just have a little thought process with the with the group I, right. i'm not on, i am on the ballot but i'm running un, unopposed so uh if you could let the other candidates know what what you care about man let's let's talk about it and let's figure out some stuff. So everyone is able to unmute themselves now. If you have a question, please unmute yourself and, and ask. Pete, I'm not sure our chat function is working. I tried to post this question earlier and it went directly to John who responded very quickly that I could call him, but since we've got a couple minutes. Um, John, what opportunities are there for citizen input on the um, development coming at 129 in Old Pendergrass? I know it came up after the um, Walmart fiasco, um, but it sounds like there's a pretty big development going in there. And I know some residents in that area are very concerned about adding that kind of traffic volume. Well, one of the things we did with that development, uh, for those of the that don't know, is we worked really hard for multiple uh, years to have connectivity from Old Pentagrass, which Karen, we both live on, uh, connectivity to old Hider, uh, Holder Siding Road and to make sure that that parallel road creates a little bit of on traffic uh, or off traffic uh, volume from one side of the city to the other. And so what we want to see is commerce coming to, to Jefferson without clogging up one of the main uh, roads of our, our community because our, our schools are on old Pentagrass and our rec centers on old Pentagrass. 
And so what we want to do is create uh, some new value for other uh, areas of our city. And so I, I think Holder Siding is a great way to, to off some of that traffic and do a right in, right out for uh, the Department of Transportation's requirements. Um, and so bringing in the, the uh, Anchor grocery store and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully a very uh, loyal chicken chain from, uh, from Georgia will <laughs> That'll be a, a, a good development for, for our citizens and having more eateries and more cultural uh, opportunities to, to, to dine in Jackson County and, and not have to go outside of the county. And uh, I, I'd, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts about that. Pete, that that means my time is up and we got to yield it back to some of these smart people. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate you being on there and I appreciate your time. And that's what I'm talking about too, is like that. I'm sure the, um, that, that is a long way to travel to be an advocate for our city to in there. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, I think I saw Mark come on here. If Mark wants to take his 10 minutes, we can do that. Then we'll, we'll be done for the night. Hey, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Y'all, uh, or went past my bedtime, so <laughs> I'm a little late getting started, but I am grateful for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I am Mark Mobley. I, I think I think that you can see my information, my contact information on the bottom of the screen. Can you see that? Fancy. Right, so if you want to reach me, that's my cell phone number. Uh, that is my city email address. You're welcome to reach out to me anytime. Um, I... I uh, don't have the questions in front of me. So if you want to run that through, I'll just, I'll talk real quickly about who I am and, and what I want to do. I've been on council since 2012. I came on council uh, after the previous district four council member uh, retired. And uh, there was a lot of strife on council then. And, and that's not the way that I wanted my city to be. Um, I heard the mayor talking a little bit about, you know, bringing some uh, commercial to Jefferson. And that's one of the things that I, I really ran on is, is I wanted to, you know, number one, heal the division that we saw, increase the communication with the community. And then I, I wanted to try to balance that commercial. And uh, that's been kind of a low, long, hard slog. The, um, the recession was still in still in effect around here when we uh, when I came on council. So we really lost income all the way up through 2015, I believe, turned around in 2016 and started growing again. And so we've done some great work since then. But but like I said, my my main thing is communicating intra and inter council. I, I really want us to be open. I want us to be transparent. I believe that everybody deserves that kind of government. Uh, from the people. I grew up here in Jefferson. Uh, I moved away for about 20 years and moved back. There was a tragedy at the Jefferson, what's called the Jefferson Church. Now it was Living Word then, and uh, they asked me to come pastor. So I was there for 11 years, and I've been doing nonprofit work since then. Uh, so Pete, if, if you want to shoot those four questions at me, I'll be glad to, to do that and then answer any of the others that somebody may have. Yeah, basically, we're, we're just we're leaving this fairly open, and I think you uh, addressed a lot of it there. Basically, there's questions about how do you handle growth when uh, and, uh, when there's, let me see, let me look at it myself there. <laughs> we, got, we, got a, we got a large population growth, and um, what examples of cities that have already undergone this growth around the metro area, what's, what's some areas that have done a good job, what do we want to avoid? Um, sure. Uh, what well, I mean... One of the things that really inspired me, I, like I said, I grew up here and I remember Gwinnett County, specifically South Gwinnett County, when it was still uh, farmland. And I saw that county explode, become the fastest growing county in the nation. And I also saw it age, it aged poorly. And one of the things that I've really tried to, to push um, is raising the standards, not just of our housing, but also of our infrastructure so that we have quality building going in, things that will last. Uh, you know, I, I, my kids kind of have a joke when you drive past the 
new car wash there at the Kroger Shopping Center. They they call that the Mark Mobley car wash because it's got four side brick car wash and they've never seen one of those before. But 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 that those are the type of things that I always worked off the theory that a bank uh, and just the story that I'd heard uh, banks used to have storefronts out in the Wild West and people would take deposits and then one day they would disappear. And so banks had to build significant buildings as proof that they were investing in a community before people would trust them with their deposits. And, and that's what I'm looking for is to maintain that quality of life and that quality of community in Jefferson. And so I'm really looking, I, I don't want just any development. I want developers that are going to invest in maintaining that quality of life here in Jefferson. Very much. Very much. Um, I think there was a, a question as well, and I think this got misinterpreted by some folks that it was not an attack or anything, but basically when I, when I said we've got a legacy of racial violence, this, this goes sure. back into the 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah. Um, and, and, the, and there were even all the way through the 90s, we had the Klan in, in downtown here. Um, yeah. Like, uh, But looking at these issues now, we actually had last year, we had large groups of folks marching in the street with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, how do we, and I think, and I think everybody, there's been a consensus there that this has not been a major issue for a lot of folks living here. And luckily we seem to be a very passive, things seem to be better here than a lot of areas around the country when you look around. So I, 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 I'd love to weigh in on that. Sure, um, sure. I agree that we have a very checkered history. And uh, I pastored here for 11 years. And one thing that was important because I did grow up here and I did see that. And I know, um, you know, I know what culture I grew up in. And it was important to me that every year that I share a sermon or part of a sermon on the sin of racism, um, you know, we, as uh, me, a, as uh, a white American, uh, need to understand that the world is not just the way that I see it through my eyes. Uh, you mentioned the march last year. I was, I was honored to, to walk in support. I, I can't say that I participated because I don't, I don't feel qualified to say that. I don't know what it's like to be on the other side. I still remember, um, had a very good friend, um, African-American friend when I was in high school and we were playing basketball and, uh, you know, we were young high school. I don't remember exactly which grade, but he did something and I said something terrible to him. And I remember the look on his face. Last time I ever said that word, it's one that I grew up with, but, but I recognized that I had crossed a line that I didn't understand and, you know, and to this day don't. And so I, I know that that's an issue here, but as I marched in that, you know, the, the Floyd uh, March last year, one of the things that I was encouraged by to, to follow up on what Pete was saying and what you've already heard tonight is the great relationship between our officers and our community that, that they knew each other by first name in a very positive way. And, and that goes back to what I was saying about keeping this a, a small town, even as we grow to, to keep those relationships intact. And, and I think that that's, that's important that, you know, I, I'm, I've made up my mind uh, to be anti-racist, you know, not, not just to not be a racist, but, you know, to, to stand against racism. Um, you know, that's something that, that I learned now, you know, do I have a lot to learn? Absolutely. But I, I agree with what you're saying, Pete, that, Absolutely, this is this is much better than many of the places that I've been, many of the things that I've seen. But we can't kid ourselves and say that we've got it all figured out. Appreciate that. Um, and I, th and I think that was we've got a question actually in, and this may be something for um, others as well. But um, 
how do we draw, this is something that wasn't on that list, but this is one from the, the audience here. Um, how do we draw young people into the area without affordable housing? We know that expensive housing draws older individuals, sure. young adults and young families, the latter of which is what will continue to bring economic growth to the community. And that's where I was in just basically, I've got kids that are going to be graduating high school soon. And will they be able, there's, I don't know of a lot of, and I know we've had folks mention there is affordable housing for folks to in their twenties, go get an apartment somewhere here. And I, I've, I'm missing you. Guys. Yeah. So. Well, sure. I, I, I'll let the, the, uh, the councilman chime in here. He's got better graphics on his name than I do, but, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I will say as a proud member of, uh, the 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 efforts that we're trying to do to, for community housing around town and Habitat for Humanity is is a board that I proudly serve on and we want quality housing but also affordable housing and we want people to be able to live in Jackson County without having to live in Ertz uh, counties that are contiguous to us to be able to come in and, and earn a living wage. Uh, I, I would say that we, we, we need to do a better job of, of looking at that issue and, and making sure that we have affordable quality housing for people throughout Jackson County. Mark, you, you're probably going to say that better than I did. Well, I, I was going to say that, you know, that's obviously an issue and, and it's, it's a difficult one. Uh, we do have some apartments that are being built uh, up on Concord Road that are behind the QT, behind um, Burger King up there, there's going to be about 300 apartments. And, and one of the things that, that, you know, when that came before council, I made the request, they, did, they didn't have to do it, but I made the request that all of those, all of those housing units be one and two bedrooms. And it served a couple of purposes. You know, number one, you know, you're talking about um, families. Once you start getting into three bedrooms, then there's a whole lot of people that want to put their kids into Jefferson schools, but they don't really want to invest in this community. They don't want to be a part of this community. I've seen so many people move in, buy a house, rent a house, move out as soon as their kids graduate. I'm looking for investment, but with one and two bedrooms, what you get is number one, you don't have the kind of um, tent dwelling families that come in and don't really put down stakes in your neighborhood and it gives opportunities for those beginners. I've got two of them living in my house, Pete. Uh, yours are about to graduate, mine already have. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's tough. It's tough when you're young. And, but these are going to be, you know, I, I hesitate to call them affordable, but they will be attainable. Um, but then when you start talking about affordable housing, that's really, really a difficult thing that's not just difficult in Jefferson. It's, it's difficult around the nation. I, I think, you know, when you look at a place like uh, San Francisco, you see people that are deeply invested in fixing that problem, but you also see the scale of it. So um, I'd love to say that, you know, we had this figured out. We've got, you know, more multifamily opportunities. In fact, I had a developer that, that came through just the other day and, you know, or a couple of developers come through the other day and I pointed out some of these properties, but, but to say that um, we've got it figured out, we don't. Well, I appreciate your answer to that. And I, pre and I think I heard the timer go off there. So I believe we are, um, have hit the end of our time there and um, actually stayed kind of on schedule, which is amazing for me there so um <laughs> thank everyone for for taking part of this i, I want to point out that we've had a, a bunch of candidates speak and i don't i don't think i heard anything nasty about anybody else i heard uh, everybody giving their their thoughts about their community and that's exactly what we need um and i appreciate everybody being on here for a couple hours that is being an active citizen and making and negating any of the, the negative stuff that can come out when you can actually hear from your folks and talk to them and not get it, get nasty rumors from passive sources, which is basically what a lot of the advertisements end up being. So uh, thank everybody for taking part. Thank you for uh, caring for running some time for us there. And, um, and this is on the Facebook um, page as well. So if there's folks that you know that should see something that somebody said, uh, share that around and and early voting is going on now over at the um, at the Jackson at the Jefferson um, 
elections, it's Jackson County election complex up in Jefferson off Gordon Street. Um, that's the only place where early voting is going this time around. That's something I'm going to push that we get our satellites uh, places open next go around. Because I think that that's really depressed some of the vote, early voting and outside of Jefferson. But um, but yeah, go vote early. Uh, make your plan to go do that. And I think everybody's given their contact information. Every one of these folks, I'm sure, will answer your call and, and give you some further further answers to any questions you got. And um, thank you all so much. And go enjoy your families. Enjoy your evening. And thank you for being part of this. It's a long night. So thanks. Thank you, Pete, for thanks. having us. Go Braves. Thanks, Pete. Appreciate it. I'm going to check that score. Yeah. Go Braves. Go Dogs. We'll see you all later. Yeah. Bye. Bye, y'all.